Right, so we're going to look at some absolute value functions. You can see on my screen I've got eight functions here. Uh, now let's just look at the first one. I've got f of x equals x plus 2. That's a linear function. And then I have g of x equals the absolute value of that linear function. Now you might want to pause it for a second and think about what that might look like. We're going to jump over to GeoGebra and really look at them. All right, here we are. I've got a list of eight functions, same as on my OneNote. Uh, let's have a look at the linear function, x plus 2. All right, it's got a gradient of 1. It passes through the y-intercept there at x plus 2. Now let's look at the absolute value of x plus 2. Okay, this red function is the absolute value of x plus 2, and you can see that it looks like x plus 2 right until it gets to the uh, x-axis, and then it bounces off the x-axis and heads off over there. That's our absolute value function of x plus 2 and uh, x plus 2, absolute value of x plus 2. Now, it isn't too difficult to get an understanding of why this might be the case. We can't get a negative value with our absolute value function here. Uh, let's just do something that you might be familiar with from primary school, let's say. So I've got my little table of values here. I'm going to plug in these values. So uh, the absolute value, I'm going to work from this side, 0 plus 2. The absolute value of 0 plus 2, 0 plus 2 is 2. The absolute value of 2 is 2. So that makes sense. Um, negative 1, negative 1 plus 2 is 1, the absolute value of 1 is 1. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0, the absolute value of 0 is 0. And then this is where it gets interesting, this is where it bounces off here. Uh, so negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1, but the absolute value of negative 1 is 1. And this is where we get our little bounce here. Negative 3, 1, negative 3, 1, right there. And negative 4, plus 2, negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2, but the absolute value of that is 2, and that's this point right there. All right, so that's what our absolute value does. It's going to make our functions bounce off the x-axis and head back up into space. Uh, so you might want to take a moment to think about what does the quadratic x squared minus 3 look like, and then what does the absolute value of x squared minus 3 look like? All right, so let's take a look at x squared minus 3 first. It's a quadratic. I'll give you that much information. And it looks a little something like that. It comes down. It's got a y-intercept at negative 3, and it moves above the x-axis. Now, what's the absolute value of x squared minus 3 going to look like? Think about it. I'm about to press it. Okay, so you can see we get a similar kind of idea. It looks exactly like x squared minus 3 until it hits the x-axis. Then it bounces off the x-axis and moves on back up there. Of course, it isn't hard to see why. Um, from negative 2, we've got negative 2 squared, which is 4, minus 3 is 1. Uh, so at negative 2, we have a value of 1. Now at negative 1, negative 1 squared is 1, minus 3 is a negative 2, but... The absolute value of negative 2 is 2. So we get this value here. Now 0, 0 squared is 0, minus 3 is minus 3, but the absolute value of minus 3 is 3. And so on and so forth. Uh, now that's how our absolute value function is going to look. Now this is a cubic um, x times x minus 3 times x plus 2. So you should be able to look at that cubic. You should be able to think about where its um, x-intercepts are. You should be able to find that really easily uh, using your null factor law. And then you should be able to think about what the absolute value of x times x minus 3 times x plus 2 might be. So let's draw our cubic, x times x minus 3 times x plus 2. Okay, well, hopefully that was what you expected. Now, uh, it's got x coordinates, uh, oh, sorry, x intercepts of negative 2, 0, and 3, which correspond with this number, this number, and 0. Uh, now, what's going to happen when we take the absolute value of this function? Think, think, think. It looks like this. Okay, you can see anything that was below the x axis is now above the x axis. It's bounced off and it's been reflected in that x axis bounced off and it's been reflected in that 
x-axis. Now I'm not going to draw up one of these little tables for everything, there's no need for that. I think we're getting the idea that if you've got an absolute value function, there's not going to be anything below the x-axis. We'll come back to that. All right, finally, we have a function, a sine function. Think about what a sine function looks like, and then think about what the absolute value of a sine function looks like. A okay, pick to the sine function, here we go. It looks like this. I'll just zoom in on that a little bit so we can get a proper look at it. There's our sine function. Now I want you to think about what your absolute value of your sine function looks like. All right, you can see we get this nice reflection it's never dropping below the x-axis. All right, that's all I need to say about absolute value functions in this video. In summary, if you want to sketch the absolute value of f of x, first just sketch f of x, however you know how to sketch it, and then reflect all portions of the graph that are below the x-axis to above the x-axis. Absolute value function.